I am joined by Peter Wood, the president of the National Association of Scholars. Mr. Wood, thank you so much for being here today. Great to be here. Well, tell us a little bit about what you do at the National Association of Scholars. What is your mission? Okay. Well, we're a 35-year-old membership organization that started out with the idea that uh, reforming American higher education in the direction of its traditional standards was going to be a cakewalk. <laughs> it turned out to be a bad theory, um, but uh, it's what we do. Um, I divide our work into uh, three categories. One of it is uh, trying to help individual faculty members who have been canceled or run into problems with political correctness. We also do in-depth research reports and we do policy work trying to convince the powers that be that American higher education is in serious need of reform. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're a membership organization with about 4,000 uh, members, most of them academics, but not all of them. Yeah. And uh, our outlook on life, I guess you would say, is that American higher education needs to do several things. It needs to pursue the truth. It needs to maintain a spirit of intellectual freedom, which goes beyond just the boundaries of mere academic freedom. Uh, and it needs to produce uh, virtuous citizens, people who understand what our country is and why it matters. Mm. And uh, those are three things which it uh, turns out to be singularly inept at doing these days. So we're, we're fighting an uphill battle. I think uh, this happens to be a moment when we see the American public awakening to just how uh, ill-served it has been by our colleges and universities. Mm. Uh, it, it's, people are now fond of recognizing that many of our nation's problems derive from the ill education that students have received. Yeah. Well, Dr. Wood, you are a scholar, you're surrounded by scholars, you work with scholars. You recently wrote a piece about the author of the New York Times 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones. The board uh, at the University of North Carolina this spring denied Hannah Jones tenure. Why is that significant? Well, the 1619 Project is uh, partly written by and partly edited by Nicole Hannah Jones. It launched in uh, August of 2019. Uh, it has become a major piece in the culture wars over what should go on in education. The Times originally launched it partly as a curriculum aimed at K-12 schools, and many thousands of schools have now adopted it. Whole school districts like Chicago and, and Buffalo took it on very quickly, but it's also spread into classrooms across the country. Um, that seems to me to be a, a, a terrible thing because the 1619 Project is, first of all, largely false. It's made up of uh, strong claims such as the uh, United States, what became the United States, began with false principles when slaves were brought to Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. But it goes on to try to demolish virtually every aspect of what we would consider American exceptionalism, that the, our ideals of freedom and equality are false because we're really a system of uh, racial repression. Uh, critical race theory is the, the broader category in which the 1619 Project falls. The 1619 Project, however, is the, the tip of the spear. It is, it is where critical race theory is being brought into the lives of children as young as six years old. Um, so I've been resisting it. The National Association of Scholars immediately launched what we called our 1620 Project. I turned that into a book which was a systematic critique of the 1619 Project. So we've been deep into the fight against Nicole Hannah-Jones, the New York Times, and the 1619 Project generally. When uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones was put up for a tenured professorship at the University of North Carolina, um, the board there took a close look at what she really stood for and decided that uh, granting her tenure was off the table. They actually made that decision in January of this year, though it wasn't reported publicly until April. When it was reported, uh, all hell broke loose. There are 
many faculty members at that university and around the country who think that this was a, a gross violation of her academic freedom. Well, she's not an academic. Uh, her highest degree is a master's degree. She has no scholarship behind her. To the extent that she is a public figure, one could recognize that a university might want to bring her in as someone who uh, has something to say, but to treat her as though she were an academic who had met the uh, rigorous standards for tenure is, is sort of silly. Um, it was a political move on the part of a politicized faculty and I think it was rightly opposed by the trustees of the university. Mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned, you know, we've seen across the country many school districts have very quickly embraced the 1619 project. Mm -hmm. It almost seems before they have a chance to even read it. Uh, how do you think uh, that we can really go about communicating well what the 1619 project actually is and then what the alternatives are for how we can be teaching history to our young people uh, in a really encompassing way? You know, not, not leaving out, of course, the sin of slavery of America's past, but also uh, not, uh, not just saying, you know, America is, is ruined, and, uh, but really telling the full story. Well, I think you're right that a lot of uh, school districts, teachers, others have just taken the 1619 project at face value. There's a claim that uh, African Americans have been left out of American history, and this is a, an occasion on which it can be replaced. Well, even the claim that African Americans have been left out of American history is a gross exaggeration. At least for the last 50 years, slavery in America has been maybe the most important topic addressed by American historians. Whole journals are devoted to it, whole careers are built on it. Many of the major works of history written during the last half century have been devoted to slavery. So it's just absolutely false that this has not been part of our told history. You have to go back a long ways to find a period when this was history that was ignored or erased. So the first thing we need to do is just remind ourselves of how much progress has been made in racial history in America and that the, the whole civil rights movement feeds into an era in which we have acknowledged the contributions of uh, African Americans to the building of this country. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, this, this journalist, wakes up one day and decides she wants to tell a story. It would have behooved her to at least tell the story accurately, not to portray Abraham Lincoln as a racist whose motive in the Civil War was to exile blacks from off the North American continent, or not to tell the story that the Declaration of Independence and the American founding were really about the efforts of Americans to prevent the British from abolishing slavery. That never happened. That threat was never made. That wasn't the reason why we fought the revolution. To start teaching young children that, uh, that fairy tale is just a terrible thing in itself because it's not truthful, but also it's destructive to our country. And I think Americans, as we begin to understand that racial division is not in our favor, that uh, building a form of education that encourages resentment and guilt uh, is a way of dividing the country that will be destructive to the lives of everybody, black and white. Yeah. So that's what we need to say. That is critical. I want to pivot for a moment. The National Association of Scholars now has a tracker for cancel culture in higher education. This is really fascinating to me. Tell me about this tracker. Well, we decided once the uh, numbers started to pile up that it would be a good thing to have one place where one can go to see how often this is happening. Um, virtually every week we get approached by another faculty member at some college or university saying, what can I do? Look at the trouble I'm in. Usually that involves some statement that the faculty member had no ill intention in making, um, minor things getting blown up into uh, big accusations and administrators panicking and thinking that unless we do something quick to suppress this person, uh, we're going to have riots on campus. So uh, we decided that uh, getting the facts out would be important. So our tracker looks at who's been accused, what the accusation is, what sort of response the college or university has made, what the outcome of that has been, 
and uh, we took it back three years, so we have a good collection now of instances. Wow. And this is all public information. It's available to whoever wants to look. How many have you all tracked? Do you know the number? Uh, we're in the hundreds now. Okay. So. Wow. Yeah. I appreciate you tracking that, but it's a little discouraging that there's that many. Is there a theme of those who are canceled? Is there anything that is sort of a you know common denominator uh, for these individuals who are canceled? No. I don't think there really is. It seems to be across all the disciplines. It happens to people in the humanities, the social sciences, and the natural sciences. Um, it happens to people who are just starting out. It happens to people who have been teaching for 40 years. Uh, if there's a theme, it is that they have uh, offended, or a student at least has said that he or she is offended. Uh, it could be a matter that the uh, faculty member has chosen not to use the preferred pronoun of a student, uh, mm. or it could be a matter that uh, uh, someone has uh, read a text by Mark Twain that uses the N-word. It, it goes across the board. Some of it has to do with the uh, racial politics on campus, some the sexual politics, and some just seems out of thin air. People can get into trouble for all sorts of things. Mm. What do you think about the fact that uh, Princeton recently decided that it was going to remove its its Greek or Latin requirement for classic majors based on uh, concerns about race concerns? Well, I don't want to overuse the word tragic, but it comes pretty <laughs> close to that. Um, the, the effort to uh, broaden the appeal of the classics by um, eliminating what the classics is all about, it seems to be a, a kind of wound to the foot. Uh, the, um, what would classics mean if you're not reading the originals in Latin and Greek? Uh, any of us at any time can sit down and read translations of the Odyssey or the Iliad or the Aeneid, uh, and we should. I mean, there are some splendid English translations of them, but that doesn't make you a uh, person who has studied the classics in the real sense of the word. Now, uh, presumably the reason Princeton's classics department wants to do this is that it's gotten woke. The, uh, the head of the department is uh, aggressively woke, and the idea is that they'll be able to attract more minorities into the department if they don't make this hard intellectual demand on them. Well, learning Latin and Greek is hard. and. Uh, Unfortunately, it's what it takes to become a, a scholar in those fields. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like the field of academia, you know, it's, it's always leaned left. Yeah. It's kind of taken up, I feel like, a radical and fast turn, much, much harder left. So uh, what are your thoughts? You know, is, is this leftist ideology coming from entirely within the United States, or are there maybe also some, some outside influences that are impacting this, this leftward agenda? Well, it's not something that's entirely in the United States. Uh, Britain, Australia, other countries are seeing much the same thing. Uh, there have been interesting headlines lately about how uh, the French government is worried that it's going to spread to France from, from the United States. Mm. A nice irony in there since so many of our ideologies have first come from France. Well, now they're blowing back at France and they don't like it. But you know, why is it happening here and now? I think that um, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the one place in the world where uh, true believers in Marxism remained in substantial numbers was the American College campus. Uh, they have never relented in their pursuit of a radical interpretation of our history. But what has happened is that a generation has grown up without the Cold War behind it, without any sense of what a Marxist government or Marxist social system really looks like. So the appeal of this idea has deepened. Well, I think there's a lot more to it than that. It connects with the uh, increasing secularization of American society. People who, who don't have any ultimate belief in God are more susceptible to the idea that we can be God. We can remake our lives from the ground up. Um, American feminism has played a part in this, um, partly in uh, deriding masculinity, and partly from uh, teaching women that uh, a, uh, a pursuit of anything is bound to run into a glass ceiling. Well, the glass ceiling may not even be there, but 
uh, the, the sense of resentment and grievance is there. And those things play into the ability of colleges and universities to present a, a radical curriculum that, that resonates to some degree with your generation. Is there any hope for our colleges and universities that we can pull them back a little bit more center? Hmm. Well, there are some colleges and universities that have resisted this, maybe a dozen or so around the country. And almost every college and university has a handful of, uh, of survivors, of, of uh, professors who aren't willing to give up. So there's always hope with that, and I, I try to speak for and to uh, those. But I would say if on uh, the broader picture, probably American higher education is going to have to uh, hit a, a real hard bump before it changes its direction. Uh, for one thing, the, the faculty members are committed to agendas that aren't going to change, and most of those people have tenure. They're not going anywhere. They're going to continue teaching what they teach. Uh, what is happening, however, is that um, parents are reaching the limit of what they can pay for. The costs of college have become extraordinary. The debt that uh, students go into to support the cost of college has become unbearably high. Um, and with the COVID shutdown, uh, large numbers of students discovered that they could get much the same education at a fraction of the price without the trouble. Now, you know, it's a complicated problem. Students do want to be on campus and meet each other and uh, enjoy the act of learning together, not simply sitting at a home in mom's basement or something like that. Um, nonetheless, the, the dynamics the, and the economics of higher education are at a crisis point, which is likely to result in the closure of a good many colleges and universities and the opening of others. I like to say that colleges and universities aren't the only way in which people engage in higher education. Uh, they never have been, and I think increasingly we're likely to see uh, students finding their way to the alternatives that are out there. So, yes. So as uh, young people are looking for a college, as maybe parents are listening and they're thinking, well, what are maybe, you know, two or three of those really good colleges that are, are still left, mm -hmm. that haven't been corrupted? Uh, who are, who are some of those in colleges that you would recommend uh, students well, consider? Um, I'm a little reluctant to be uh, praising brands, but I can name some of the, the ones that I think pe people probably already know about, like Hillsdale and Grove City and uh, University of Dallas, uh, all of which are, are quite estimable places. I, um, I'm actually working on a, a list of recommendations that I hope to make public soon, which will have many more than, than those on it. Um, the, uh, I also think it's a, a crucial thing that people who are considering going to uh, universities that aren't on the list of ones that I think are, are really solidly safe understand that there are um, there are good departments and there are good programs within other universities, including many that uh, have adopted uh, policies overall that look pretty dismal. So uh, if you're a good shopper, you can find the places to go in American higher education where a first-rate education is available, just don't be taken in by uh, the programs that are uh, praised relentlessly but aren't very good. So. Dr. Wood, thank you. I really appreciate your time today and thank you for the work that you're doing at the Association of Scholars. Well, thank you for having me.